Good morning. Good morning. And welcome in the name of Jesus Christ to McCownville United Methodist Church. As United Methodist Christians, we are called to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. If you're attending from home this morning, you may post your prayers on the Facebook feed. We will continue to uplift your prayers this morning and throughout the week. An announcement and notes flyer to read is available in the back of the sanctuary on the small table at the entry. If you would like the church to be in touch with you, fill out a contact us card and leave it in an offering plate. The offering this morning will be collected at the end of worship. During the service, there will be a time to reflect on your offering in response to God's blessings. Then, as you exit, please leave your offering in the plates at the end of the back pews, or you can mail it to the church office or donate online. A few announcements this morning. A fish fry is this Friday, and movie night on the next day, Saturday. Uh, just a reminder that uh, today is a deadline for gift cards, the physical gift cards. Uh, so there's a, a list in the back. Uh, also, Nancy Rhodes will be selling dry goods in mason jars next Sunday, Palm Sunday, as a fundraiser. Uh, the Brooks Barbecue fundraiser will be April 27th. As always, we are looking for volunteers to help with that. And finally, uh, Kelly Visker is asking for help with coffee hour for Easter Sunday. So if you could pitch in with that, please see Kelly. All the announcements I have, would anything else, anyone else like to see? If not, let us hear from our choir.
Please join me in the opening prayer. Healing and empowering God, we are sometimes so sure that things will not work out. We doubt even your ability to put things right in our lives. We lack such faith, but Jesus came to show us that our most dreaded enemy, death, can be overcome by faith. Heal our doubts and our longings for assurance, and give us spirits of trust and hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And the prayer of confession. God, we confess that we are frightened by death. We have experienced the loss of loved ones and have heard all too often of the horrible losses sustained by the young people who live in lands of warfare and strife. In the scripture today, we encounter Lazarus and his family. They too long for Lazarus to be alive again. Jesus' power to resurrect Lazarus confuses us. We long for that type of healing for our loved ones. And so, when their bodies cannot be healed and they die, we slip away from our faith proclaiming that it is a nice story. Give us courage to face our fear. Give us awareness that you have offered to all those who have gone before us a place in your kingdom. Help us move away from the prison of death to the light of eternal life and hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Hear these words of assurance. Though darkness and death appear all around, there is the comforting healing light of God's love shining on you and in you. Feel the warmth of the presence of God and let go of your fear, for God is with you. Amen. Guess what time it is? I better get down before I get blocked out of here today, huh? Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. All right, are you with me? Yes. yes. yes? How about you? Yes. All right. We got a message coming up. I want you to stay awake until that starts. That's about what happens, isn't it? Happy St. Patrick's Day. I see some of you are dressed in green, huh? Yes, it's a great celebration to celebrate St. Patrick. I can't find a green dress. You couldn't find a green dress? Well, if you notice, I don't have a green shirt on either. But instead of St. Patrick's Day, I'd rather talk to you today about something else that goes with our scripture. You're going to love this, huh? Easter Sunday? Easter Sunday? Not yet, but uh, we're getting there. We're getting closer. I want to talk to you about crying. What? Crying. Yeah. You ever cry? Yeah. I cry sometimes. What do you cry about? If you get hurt, I do. I'm kind of about getting hurt. What else? Anything else? You ever cry when you're sad? Yeah? Did you ever cry when you saw somebody else who was sad and hurting? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. I cried when I went out of iced tea. Did you? <laughs> no. But there's all kinds of things that make us cry. Um, and today, Jesus is going to, a friend of his passed away, he died, his name's Lazarus. And Jesus is going there to be with his sisters and to do a miracle. And it says that when Jesus saw them and went to the grave, he cried too. Did you know that Jesus cried? 
There was another time he cried. You know when that was? Next week we celebrate Palm Sunday, right? And Jesus, huh? He cried when he was riding down on the donkey and saw Jerusalem and the people were missing what God wanted them to do. The blessings that God had in store for them. Sometimes Jesus cried because we don't get it and we go through rough times and he said, you don't have to do that because God is with you. But we don't see that. We see things our way. We see the problem and not God, huh? And pray. But crying sometimes can be good for us to to cleanse us and to heal us. But I think it's really great to think that Jesus cried too, don't you? Huh? That he cried for us, he cares for us, and he understands when we're sad. Isn't that great? Yes? You're not sure? Huh? Yeah, it is. It's wonderful to think that. So let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank you for the love that you give us and the love we see in these precious children, we thank you for the love of Jesus who cares and just let them know, Lord, if they're ever sad, if they're ever hurt, that not only the mom and dad care for them, but you care for them and love them just as much, Lord. You are with us in all our hurts. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, you may help yourself to the candy dish and so we just see to hear more about Lazarus. Thank you. Have a great day. Good morning and happy St. Patrick's Day to all of you um, that are wearing green and celebrating all the blessings of the day. We come together now to, to share together in prayer, to lift up the prayers for one another. Um, I have a prayer from John Levine asking for prayer for a friend of his going through some tough times that may he find strength uh, to see the goodness in life and his purpose in life. Um, prayer that was on Facebook, we lift up that for John's friend. Um, Emma Harrandy, we continue to lift you up and your granddaughter Karen and family. Um, Amor Branton, the father of Halo, the little child that was found in Schenectady last week that had died. Um, please, uh, Keep Amor and uh, family in prayer. Melissa got to, to meet with him. He's a friend of um, the parents of our godson, Elijah. And uh, <clears throat> just pray for that family during this difficult time. Are there others that you have this morning? Colleen O'Brien is asking for prayers again for Matt, her friend who's battling cancer. Colleen O'Brien, lifting prayer for Matt, who is fighting cancer. We pray for Matt, for his doctors and caregivers, and for healing. Yes? I have a 
A toy. Take them. Your brother from Ohio is here. Welcome, brother from Ohio. What a blessing. Enjoy. Uh, any others? Yes. Aubrey's here to celebrate her 18th birthday. Awesome. Thank you, Aubrey. I'm glad that James did not embarrass you at all. Or, um, happy birthday to you. Glad you were here. You probably would have come back had he not done that. Um, any others this morning? Yes. Our secretary, the church secretary, Christine Gould's husband and mother who are having health difficulties and puts a lot of additional strain on her. We pray for them and for her, Lord. Hear our prayers. Thank you for that. Um, any others? Yes. I see a hand down here, no. As always, I know that the we come here with a bunch of prayers on our hearts. Where's Steve this morning? Is he here? Snotty. He's snotty? Yeah. Okay. We pray for Steve's snottiness and he gets well. Um, we come with different circumstances and prayer concerns for ourselves and for loved ones. And I just hope that in this time of prayer together, you find peace and you, you find God is present with you. They give you the peace and strength and the healing that you pray for. Let's be together and pray for one another and with one another. Gracious God, it is so good to slow down our busy lives and to just be still and know that you are God. May the light of your holy presence shine upon us as we lift our prayers before you this morning. Lord, you have heard our prayers both spoken and the unspoken prayers of our hearts that we've lifted before you in this time of prayer. Lord, we thank you for hearing our prayers. We weep with those who weep, and we celebrate with those who are experiencing the joys of life, the celebrations of family and birthdays, Lord, today. We pray also for the world that you've created, for the environment itself and for all everywhere 
who are in need of prayer. We pray for our nation and our leaders and for all who may be suffering from war, violence, from poverty, living in fear or desperation. Speak your words of healing, your words of hope, Lord. Lord, hear our prayers, and Lord, we have come a long way on this Lenten journey. For so many of us, we know where the scriptural road ends, and we know that it will take us, and that we will walk triumphantly into Jerusalem, eat a supper meal with Jesus, and watch as he is taken from the garden and brought before the authorities. We will weep at the foot of the cross as he speaks words of love and forgiveness. And we will wail at the tomb. We do not like this part of the journey and we would just as soon skip it. But here we have the story of his friend Lazarus who has died, his sisters, Mary and Martha have confidence that he could have been healed, but they do not think that he can be raised from the dead. That is the part of our problem, Lord. We want to have confidence in the healing, restorative power of Jesus, but we cannot escape our fears of the arch enemy, death. Jesus, proclamation of eternal life is real. We need to let go of our fears for life in eternity is also God's promise, a home with God. We can come out of our darkness. Help us, Lord. Lord, can we risk believing in Jesus? Those are hard questions and cannot be answered without the trip to Jerusalem, to the cross, and to the tomb. God, please be with us on this journey. We ask it in Jesus' name as we pray as he told us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Today's scripture reading is from the book of John, chapter 11, verses 1 through 7 and 30 through 44. <clears throat> now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, notice how quickly she got up and went out. They followed her supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not, 
When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Thank you, Tom. Tom is so enthusiastic when he's up here, I love it. I think he should have been a preacher, don't you? Um, yeah, I love those words when says, Lazarus come out, and I've heard it said that he had to say Lazarus come out or everybody in the cemetery would have come out if he just said come out. <laughs> so he had to speak specifically to him. I want to put this in context a little bit for us in our Lenten journey. During the week leading up to Palm Sunday, Jesus continued to perform miracles in Judea. And among them was the resurrection of Lazarus in Bethany. As this miracle took place, it took place really close to Jerusalem. And the report of it was soon spread throughout the city. And of course, the chief priests and the Pharisees got hold of it. And they were irritated by this miracle. So they held a council in which they resolved on the death of this rebel rabbi. And they commanded all those that had any knowledge of his whereabouts to make it known. And after the, the resurrection of Lazarus, Jesus retired to the town of Ephraim until the time of the Passover meal. So today, we encounter some people who are confronted with one of the hardest problems that we as Christians can face. And we talked about this in our series on doubt. And now here it is again, explained and, and an example of it in action in our scriptures today. Do you know what it is? It's one that I wrestle with too. What do you think it is? What to do when God does not do what I have been taught to expect God to do. When God gets out of line and does not act the way that I think God ought to do, what do I do? We have an occasion like that in the story of the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Now John introduces in his gospel this last of the great miracles of Jesus in chapter 11. And he announces it with these words. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village in the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Martha and Mary that you've heard throughout scripture. And it was Mary who anointed Jesus' feet with the oil and wiped them with her hair, whose brother, it's her brother Lazarus, who is ill. 
So the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, he who you love is sick. When the message reached Jesus, this is the remarkable response from Jesus. He says, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. The remarkable thing I think about that is if you carefully check out the timing in this event, Lazarus was already dead when the message reached Jesus. It took two days for the messenger to get to Jordan. So when Jesus returned to Bethany, Lazarus had been dead for four days. It is difficult for us to believe that Jesus didn't know that, isn't it? Wouldn't you think he would have known that? But he sees this as a signal from God that something big is going to happen in connection with it. So he sent back another message. He says, this illness will not result in death. In verse five and six, we get the real shocker, however, when we hear, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Isn't that a shocker? Can you believe that? Wait, what a, wait a minute, what? That's confusing to us, isn't it? That's the part of the story that's hard to handle. Martha loved Jesus. Mary loved Jesus. Lazarus loved Jesus. And Jesus loved them. So from what the scripture says, we know that their home was a place that was filled with love and that it was one of the most welcome havens for Jesus during his three-year ministry. He visited them often. But when Jesus hears that Lazarus is sick, what does he do? He waits. It is a tough thing to believe that Jesus deliberately delayed his return. He waited. We are so used to critical illness when we get that word. It's a signal for immediate action. Wailing sirens, right? Flashing lights, frantic phone calls. Get down to the hospital now. We're so used to that that it seems incredible that Jesus knowing that his friend was ill, or in this case, dead, stayed right where he was for two more days. Now, some people may say that, well, if he knew Lazarus was dead already, why would he hurry? There's nothing that he could have done anyway. But remember, Mary and Martha were hurting. Their hearts were breaking. This was a dearly loved brother of Jesus. And his death would be a grievous loss to them. Jesus' presence with them would have been a tremendous comfort. Even if he never did anything about raising Lazarus from the dead. And yet, <clears throat> knowing that they needed him there to comfort them, knowing that they longed to have him there to the point that they sent a messenger to let him know of the situation. He deliberately remained two days longer where he was. Why? Why? That's the question that we all ask. <clears throat> Why? When you have gone to God for help that you feel you desperately need and nothing happens, when your heart is breaking over something <clears throat> and you need God to intervene, but the heavens are silent. It is tough to understand. It's tough to accept. Tough to get any kind of grip on that. But think about what this passage is telling us. It is telling us that a delay is an answer, huh? A delay when God is, it, we're going to God. And when God delays in his answer, an answer like that, 
It is not a sign that God is indifferent or that a failure to hear our prayers. It is a sign of God's love. The delay may well be for our sake and it just may be so that Christ may be glorified through it. Jesus deliberately delayed going to Mary and Martha because he loved them and knew <clears throat> that their faith and trust would become stronger as they learned the outcome that God would eventually do through him. Now that is a hard lesson to accept, but it works. Something we expect or something we long for doesn't happen. And then all of a sudden, boom, just when we think everything is lost and there is no hope, God does something that totally reverses our perspective. The outcome is totally different than we were worried about or thinking about. Think of the reaction in Bethany. Just think of this, as the messenger returns with the news that when he told Jesus that Lazarus was ill, Jesus said, this illness will not result in death. Yet when the messenger got back with the message, Lazarus had been dead for two days. How do you think those sisters felt when they got that message? According to John's account, two days later after that, Jesus says to his disciples, you know what, let's go back to Judea. Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going to wake him up. Now the disciples, who had every reason to believe that if they returned to Judea, that Jesus would be stoned to death, they protest, saying, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. To which Jesus replies, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake, I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. Notice that Jesus says he was glad he was not there when Lazarus died for the sake of the disciples. Just as Jesus delayed his going to Mary and Martha for their sake, so that they may believe too, so that their faith might be stronger, so that they might see his glory when the actual event happens. So he delayed for the sake of his disciples, so that they might believe. I want to tell you that there have been times when I have cried out to God for help. And I have said, God, things are so bad, and I don't think it can get any worse Lord, I need you to do something. Help me. No answer. Nothing came. That is hard. It's hard to believe. It's hard to wait. But I am gradually learning that this is never the end of the story. Gradually, I am learning that it's true what God said so clearly through the prophet Isaiah when he said, my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways. That is what's so difficult. God is sovereign. We forget that. God is not a mortal that God should act the way that we act. There are dimensions of the problem that we may be facing which God sees that we don't even remotely imagine, and we can't. There are possibilities and opportunities in every situation that we can't even conceive of. So we have to wait, and we have to trust. Lazarus is dead, and for your sake, I'm glad I was not there, so that you may believe. As we go on in the story, Jesus arrives at the outskirts of Bethany. And we see that Martha greets Jesus 
with a phrase that must have been frequently on all of their lips when Lazarus was ill. How many times must they have said, oh, if Jesus were only here. They had said it so many times that it came automatically to Martha's lips when she saw him and met him. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, I don't believe this is a word of reproach. Martha isn't criticizing him. Martha's not saying, Lord, why didn't you come sooner? We sent for you. If you had responded, we wouldn't be in this mess. It is clear from the account that she realizes that the messenger did not reach him until Lazarus was already dead. Martha's words rather is one of regret. She is sorry that the God was, that Jesus wasn't there. Lord, I wish you could have been here because if you had, my brother would not have died. And then, then she goes on to say, but even now, even now, whatever you ask of God, God will give it to you. What is it that she expects? What does she want from him? Now, some of the commentaries I read, some, some say that she really did expect Jesus to raise Lazarus from the dead by her words, even now. But I think that they're missing the point here because the very next words of Jesus is, your brother will rise again. If Martha had any idea that would happen then, she would have said, oh, how wonderful, Lord, that's just what I expected you to do. But she doesn't say that. What she says is, yes, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Clearly, Martha is not looking for an immediate resurrection of her brother. What then does she want from Jesus? What is she looking for? What does she mean by those words, even now, whatever you ask of God, God will give to you. She is looking for his comfort, for the release that only God can give to a heart that is torn with grief, anticipating the loneliness of the days ahead. God alone can give that inward peace. Many have testified to that. And that is what Martha is asking for. Even now, even though he is gone, there is so much that God can give in times like this. As we engage in this story, we can see that Martha's faith is like the faith that we so often have. She believes in what she thinks will happen now and in the future, rather than, rather than in what God could do at any time. How many times have you said to yourself, I know that God has worked in the past, and I believe that God will work again in the future. But today is obviously not the day of miracles. It's not today. This is Martha's faith. Faith in the future at the resurrection of the last day. Yes, the program of God is certain, she believes. But for today, well, that's a different matter. The same thing can be said of Mary, who greets Jesus with the same word. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Neither Mary nor Martha, nor any of the others who accompany her to the graveside, nor the disciples expect what happens next. They do not even hope for it. They don't ask for it. They don't even hope for it. How often are we in the same position when it comes to God's work in our lives, in our brokenness, in our grief, in our despair? 
we weep as Mary wept. We weep and we expect nothing. Nothing but heartache for today and for as long as we live. <clears throat> Notice, Jesus wept too. It says that Jesus asked where they had laid Lazarus. And as he started out toward the tomb, he wept. Why? Why do you think he was weeping? He weeps not because he loves Lazarus, not because Lazarus has died, because he knows what he is about to do. He weeps because Mary weeps. He weeps because he is sharing in the heartache of the sisters, because he sympathizes with them in their pain. I remember hearing a story of a little girl who hurt her finger and she ran to her daddy who was very busy doing some paperwork uh, in his office in the house. And she showed him her finger, but he was so caught up in what he was doing that he just looked at it and said, mm -hmm, that's it, it'll be all right, honey. And he sent her out. She ran to her mother, weeping and crying, and her mother said, oh dear, does it hurt so much? The little girl said, no, mommy. It's just that daddy didn't even say, oh. She just wanted somebody to say, oh, with her, to comfort her. In Romans 12, Paul tells us to weep with those who weep and to rejoice with those who rejoice. In our scripture today, Jesus sets an example of this. Knowing that he is going to turn it all around, he yet feels sorrow for their hearts and he weeps with them. And then Jesus, deeply moved again, comes to the tomb. It was a cave and there was a stone across it. And Jesus says, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Did I not tell you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And notice how he answers. <clears throat> he doesn't rebuke her. He encourages her in the words, remember what I said. Did I not say to you, if you believe, you would see the glory of God. And then Jesus begins with a really simple prayer. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and he said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. Notice the many times in this account that we have read today, that what Jesus did, he did for the sake of those involved. Earlier, <clears throat> he said to the disciples, I'm glad I was not there for your sake. He stayed two days where he was when the messenger reached him and told him about Lazarus because he loved Mary and Martha. Now, he prays out loud for the sake of the people there at the tomb. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and his feet bound with bandages, and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. So what does this miracle say to us today? One answer is that 
we can turn to the scripture and find answers for our hurts and our problems in that. And one of those answers comes from Paul in his second letter to Timothy. Timothy was a young man, an apprentice of Paul, we'll say, who was left in the pagan city of Ephesus. He had to struggle to live as a Christian in that polluted pagan culture, just as we do today in our society. He was often discouraged, sometimes defeated, facing many problems. He was a young man, and he was afraid. What were Paul's words to him? He said, Timothy, remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead. Remember Jesus right where you are. Remember, he is with you. This is his word. He is with you. He knows how to lead you through it. Focus on Jesus, not on the solution to your problem. Trust in him, despite the delay. Turn to him, knowing that he is able and knowing that whatever you are facing, may just be a pathway to new life. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your word and for this miracle of Lazarus raising from the dead. There's so much that we can glean from it, Lord. And wherever we may be today, help us to remember those words that you are with us, that you care, and that you can turn the impossible into the possible. May we trust and may we believe. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
prayer for our offering this morning in response to God's amazing generosity and love for us. God has been so good, huh? In so many ways and provides for so many ministries to so many people. So many faces we never see that make grace this place that his lives are transformed and changed because of your generosity. God has given us all we need and more, and now we come and reflect on God's goodness as we prepare to give back to God this morning. Gracious God, generous God, we thank you so much for your gifts and we pray that you may be pleased in our joyful and generous giving to you, Lord. Use these gifts, use our lives for your glory in this place, in this community and beyond. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name, amen. And now the Lord, we pray that you would unbind us from our fears and doubts as we go from this place of worship. Be with us in our witness to the power and love of Jesus Christ in the world. Amen. Go in peace. Mm -hmm.